Um, All right, take it away, Thomas. Okay, great. So uh, this this can be seen, yes, and this is good. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so uh, hi, my name is Thomas. Thank you guys so much for having me here. Um, I've brought I've brought quite a a, a broad based talk for you, um, but it's it's the result of uh, three years of work that I've been doing here with that I was doing with uh, David Poulon, uh, and I'll talk about that at the end. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it's it's quite a broad based talk, and I, I you know we're we're meeting virtually. So if you have any questions in the middle, I probably have backup slides that that will um, sort of help out. Uh, but what I'll say sort of at the beginning is um, uh, it covers um, a, oh my a lot of fields, uh, so, and and they're all sort of in my background. So they're you know to the level that I need them. Uh, I've I've published on these things before, but uh, um, uh, so this this talk will cover uh, quantum chemistry, machine learning, and quantum computing, and so we're going to try and sort of mix all of those together and, and come up with something new. Um, so uh, just as a as a forewarning, I, I'm in this talk I'm sweeping all of the machine learning under the rug because I, I think uh, we can just regard it as awesome curve fitting here, and and there's already quite a bit of literature on this uh, for density functionals. Um, and then because you guys are a quantum computing institute, I, I sort of shy away from those details a little bit and, and talk a little bit more about quantum chemistry. But if there's anything that's unfamiliar here or that you wanna talk about more, please let me know and, and we can loop back and, and check it out. So first we'll go through quantum chemistry and then talk about quantum computing. And then um, we'll talk about this new algorithm that we're proposing that hopefully fits some of the constraints that we'll identify in quantum computing. And uh, this algorithm is pretty general. So the quantities that you can derive from it are, are also very general. And I'll talk about the three that I think are the most important to consider here. Although if you have your favorites, please you know, let me know at the end and, and we can talk about how feasible it might be to, to put those on the quantum computer. Okay, so quantum chemistry. Um, uh, quantum chemistry uh, is something that you've probably seen hints of before, but we being in physics, we, we tend to look down on sort of other fields, uh, unfortunately, uh, at other times. So part of my intention in this, this first little bit is that I want to just sort of convince you that this is useful and, and, and uh, uh, you know, worthy of being studied, because uh, I, I sort of want to encourage you to, to look at these methods yourself and, and in order to do that, you need to have faith that, that you'll actually get something out of that. So um, my story begins probably not where other people begin it. Um, I'm going to start it in 1998 when the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, was awarded to John Popel and one other physicist that we'll talk about uh, uh, later on. So the, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was won by a chemist and a physicist. Um, but so John Popel was essentially, he, he gets a lot of credit for developing a lot of wave function methods. And the general idea is, is that given um, an arrangement of protons that would describe some sort of molecular configuration, you can use that as an external potential and then solve Schrodinger's equation, which is equation one uh, on, this, on this review of modern physics paper um, that, that he has. And if you're able to solve that, then from the wave function, you'll be able to determine the electronic structure of the computation and that will then tell you exactly what is going on in terms of uh, um, the chemistry that should be. And so this has a lot of applications, but uh, I, I think maybe the, the most familiar point that, that you may have seen is in your introductory chemistry classes, they tend to show you figures like this. And uh, one of the um, uh, things about this is, you know, you might ask, well, how do you know that the, the atoms arrange themselves in, in such and such an order? And, you know, for example, a water molecule, how do you know that it's about 120 degrees? Uh, I don't know if that's, I think it's 120.9 or something. Uh, but how do you know that it's tilted at that angle or for this more complicated molecule that's in the center here? How do you know that it's uh, sort of arranged in this way or for the, the, the carbon, you know, how do you know that it's planar? And you, you could do sort of experimental measurements or because this is a more theoretically based talk, you could just sh solve Schrodinger's equation. And so that's basically the program that we're going to do today. So um, the uh, Hamiltonian that you have to solve is known 
in this field because, because we know that Coulomb's interaction provides a force between electrons. We know that electrons need to move and we know that there's an external potential that's provided by, by the, the positive charges in the system or whatever else you have in there. So this is solving the many body problem and sometimes it goes by the, the theory of everything, but essentially you have two terms in the Hamiltonian. One is very easy and is probably more familiar from a beginner quantum mechanics class and that's the, the quadratic term. So the C dagger C term in the, in the Hamiltonian. And that has a, a one electron integral and you need to compute this, this one electron integral in order to get the, the, the elements of the matrix. And the elements of the matrix that pertain to the quadratic term are a kinetic energy, which is the first term in the one electron integral and an external potential, which for all intents and purposes just describes the, the, the positive nuclei that are sitting in a system. Now there's a second, so this first term is probably familiar and it's just a non-interacting problem. This is very easy to solve. However, the uh, second term is where all the complication comes in. So this is the electron-electron interaction. And given some Coulomb interaction that uh, exists between the, uh, um, uh, uh, between the electrons, we can compute the two electron integral. And this two electron integral will sort of contain all of the complexity of the problem. And that comes out in this quartic term. So it turns out that this Hamiltonian is very hard to simulate efficiently, even on a quantum computer. Uh, the, the, compl the computational complexity to do this is uh, QMA complete. So we shouldn't be expecting efficient solutions here, but anything that you can do to make this better is going to make modern life much different and, and, and you're, you'll be able to build uh, better technologies if you know how to solve this equation. So in order to simulate it as well as we can, you're going to need a good basis function. So you'll notice that this equation is written in second quantization and the indices i and j pertain to uh, um, basis functions in the system. And so in addition to a good basis, you're also gonna need a good method in order to simulate the Hamiltonian. So essentially what we're gonna talk about here is um, sort of basic aspects of this before we then go to quantum computing. And, and if we do the, our job here, then the idea is that we can do a lot of applications uh, uh, that are based on this Hamiltonian because we're basically describing all materials so that should have an immediate, you know, all, all, of, all of us are using a computer. So if we didn't understand how to solve this equation, we might not be able to have come up with the computer in the first place. So, so this should be a, um, a, 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 a worthy problem to, to look at. So in terms of basis functions, I've, I've seen the, the, the couple that I'm highlighting here are the ones that I've seen in the, the quantum chemistry for quantum computing literature. So. Uh, there's been a couple of recent works um, that I think are, are good to, to mention uh, but, uh, about plane waves, but I, 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 I'm going to say some negative things, so I won't show you what the papers are. Um, but so the plane waves are very good for periodic systems. Uh, uh, but I, the thing to keep in mind about plane waves is that uh, while they have some nice properties that make them local, um, there's a non-analyticity of the wave function. So if you go out and you solve uh, for the wave function of hydrogen, there's a non-analyticity that is shown on this diagram at the bottom uh, uh, here. And that non-analyticity requires thousands or more of, of basis functions in order to describe. So in order to really use these, you, you might have to go to large numbers of, of functions, although it, it really depends on the level of accuracy that you need. Um, uh, but you have to define a, a plane wave cutoff and then, and then go, to, go with this. Um, so plane waves uh, have been uh, discussed and. Also, um, uh, I'm partially responsible for this one. So I, I just wanna clear up your understanding in case anyone was gonna go off and try and use wavelets uh, for this. Um, but uh, in a couple of, of reviews for uh, um, quantum chemistry on the quantum computer, it was proposed that you could use a wavelet-based basis function. And these have very nice properties to them. They essentially act like a, an RG analysis. So, so you're probably most familiar with wavelets um, they, they're used to do image compression. So you can kick out uh, basically high frequency features of an image and have it still retain its resolution to the naked eye. Um, and it was proposed in the 90s that maybe these would constitute a, uh, a basis function set. Um, in the 30 years that these have been uh, 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 around, they, they cost 
quite a bit to solve interacting problems. So for three electrons, it costs tens of thousands of basis functions and, and you can find them that are, are useful in particular situations and, and uh, uh, in particular for um, you know, cases where you can identify a one dimensional feature in your quantum chemistry problem. So these are, these are functions that sort of exist in the literature, but um, really the functions that we want to do, uh, that we want to focus on, that we want to use in general for quantum computation, uh, uh, for quantum chemistry systems, don't suffer from this curse of dimensionality that is the, the last bullet point on this slide. And um, this curse of dimensionality is essentially, essentially affects plane waves and, and wavelets and all of these things. But we really want to use something that is less um, obvious to the physics background, if, if that's your background. Um, but we want to use functions that are not necessarily orthogonal and do not necessarily have all the nice features of a, a grid or something that we're used to seeing in a, a physics class. So the canonical example of a basis function that we might pick is we might try and tile the space with Gaussian functions. And these Gaussian functions are nice because they reduce those one and two electron integrals to something that is analytic. Um, another popular wave function are these Vanier functions that, I'll, I'll, that I've also put up here. And that's for some reason, the, the image that comes up when you go to the Wikipedia page for Vanier functions. But so in general, in terms of writing down the problem, we're going to wanna to keep a very um, broad idea of what a basis function might, might do for a quantum chemistry system trying to sort of bring the problem to us by picking like a super intelligent basis set that might make the problem smaller. This turns out to be a very difficult computation to do. So uh, instead, Thomas, I, yes. Uh, so the 1A functions, is that just wave packets? I think you might've mentioned it or no? Um, the Gaussian wave pack, because I remember Gaussian from undergrad. Sure. And I thought they used Gaussian. Yes, set. yes. Uh, yeah, so some physicists look at Gaussians and they say, oh no, they're not orthogonal. So I no longer solve an eigenvalue problem. I solve a generalized eigenvalue problem. And then they, they get a little bit uncomfortable about this because you have to uh, generate an overlap matrix and this, this causes a, a, some computational difficulty. For the quantum chemists, however, they don't care about this. It's, it's a very natural thing to use Gaussians um, but somehow in the quantum chemistry liter literature, the, the physics opinion has percolated in. So I, I, just in case anyone was going to look at these, uh, I, I wanted to encourage them to get comfortable with Gaussian functions. Um, for the Vanier functions, it, uh, 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 they're, they're used a lot in strongly correlated systems. And uh, things. Can I ask another question since we've interrupted you already? Um, sure. So you mentioned this QMA uh, completeness. Uh, I mean, if it's QMA complete, should we, uh, I mean, should we be trying to solve it? I mean, then probably nature also doesn't solve it. I'm sure you, get, you were going to mention this, but it's the obvious question. Uh, I, I, that's a, that's a, I like the phrasing of that, uh, that nature, <laughs> does nature solve it? Um, that's a great question. Uh, what I would say is, is that any improvement that you do that can possibly solve it, or, or possibly solve an approximation of it can lead to big improvements in technology. So uh, feel free to chime in again, but it, it's a great segue actually into the next slide where I say, you know, now that we've picked a basis set, we have to pick an approximation of the Hamiltonian. So I think the one that might be most familiar to people is hartree fock and that essentially leaves off correlation energies in the Hamiltonian. And then this allows you to just get Hartree and, and exchange terms that go uh, uh, in the equations that you solve, but can I, so maybe maybe just so, sorry to just to, to follow up. I mean, do you think? Or I know that like in general, this Hamilton of this form, the general one is QMA complete. But uh, is there a, a proof that a sort of the actual like a uh, quantum chemistry problem that you know we have like in a big? Um, I'm not even sure how to phrase it correctly because you need the scaling with n. Um, but is is there is there a way to kind of have evidence that the actual problems that you know electrons solve in nature are Q make complete? Uh, uh, yes. So I, I I'm so glad you asked. These I I knocked out this slide. Um, I I don't want to derail you. If that's I'm sorry. I no, I'm I'm happy for this. I I purposefully cut it down because I I expected some questions. So this is perfect actually. Um, so the paper that I think is the most pertinent. Uh, for us here, and I'm skipping ahead a, a little bit, um, but I, I particularly like this one by uh, uh, Frank Verstrada and Norbert Schuch. Um, so it, 
totally relevant to the, the, the topic of conversation here. It is QMA complete to find the universal functional and it's QMA complete to find the wave function in general. Um, so I, I, the, the only part of your question that I hesitate on is I know that the proof that they're basing this off of is for, I think it's a 2D spin system that they were using, some, some glassy spin system. And uh, if, if I remember that correctly, but um, uh, so, you know, in terms of is, is, a, is a specific problem actually QMA complete? What I would say is, you know, QMA complete does not stop efficient algorithms from eventually finding an approximate answer. So if I turn my Hartree-Fox solver onto the electrons and I leave off the correlation, I might wind up with an answer that is commensurate with what I find in experiment. So these methods, while they, they receive approximations in order to solve these many body problems, they can often lead to uh, um, you know, quantum chemistry and quantum physics that uh, is useful. So um, one slide that I did uh, take away that is good to mention here uh, in terms of this is, um, you know, all of these things can be simulated from quantum chemistry problems. So if you have a graphene sheet and you want to make a flexible, um, uh, uh, you know, cell phone that you can bend the screen, graphene is a great thing to do this, but in order to actually simulate this and, and inform experiment, you need many body calculations in order to figure out you know, the durability of these graphene sheets is not very long. So this can uh, play havoc. And I, I think the other one worth mentioning in, in these pandemic times is on the lower right. It's if you wanna find the, the, the relaxed structure for a benzene compound for a new medicine, then it would be highly advantageous to have some attempt to solve this problem, even though it's probably beyond reach. So it's not efficiently solvable, but we still try anyways. I think the, the response from that. Are you aware of any molecule for which it's QMA complete? Like I could imagine a chain of atoms or a chain of carbons or something. Um, no, that's a good that'll question. That'll scale with N, right? Something will scale with N there. Um, yeah. Hmm. I, I, I don't know if anybody's gone through and really like assigned, but I, well, actually maybe I should say somebody probably has, but I'm not aware of it. I, I don't know. I don't know if somebody has said this molecule is QMA complete in the thermodynamic limit or something like that. Um, but I, I, I do know that the many body problem is sufficiently hard to, to be difficult to solve. Um, yeah, okay, so, so we can pick an algorithm and we can try to solve it. And really the only one that we care about today, well, we care only about two statements. Exact diagonalization is too hard. So for this audience, that's just to say that we shouldn't be expecting some algorithm that will solve every problem. Then uh, density functional theory is the one that we're going to use today because that's the most compact version on this list. Um, but before I go into that, uh, the uh, attempts to solve quantum chemistry problems on the quantum computer uh, goes back almost as far as, as the field goes. The, the, the main idea is we know that quantum computers can solve some problems more efficiently than classical computers. Uh, for this audience, I think I'll say, you know, the Deutsch-Yosa <laughs> algorithm that may not have a use for anything. This um, definitely, it's proven to be faster or, you know, a Grover search has proven to be faster than a, a classical algorithm. So uh, can we find something on the quantum computer that would allow us to solve these problems more efficiently since it's a new computing paradigm? And I've already spoiled the, you know, the, the fun of finding out that it's QMA complete, but let's try anyway, why not? And in this paper, um, it was sort of a, a first attempt to do this. And I, I think I'm not even showing the figures from that paper. I'm showing the figures from another paper um, that came out a little bit later uh, that's cited there. But essentially what they do is they pick some, from the quantum chemistry perspective, very easy molecules to solve. And then they prepare the wave function on the quantum computer, and then they measure the energy. And that's sort of just the, the barest, broadest stroke of what they're doing. And the black points, if I understand what, the, what they wrote in the caption correctly, the black points are what they get out of the quantum computation. And the dashed line that is for each of the, the, the three molecules, this is the exact answer that you can get from classical computation. So you might look at this and you might say, wow, this is really great. I'm being able to simulate quantum chemistry on a quantum computer. And this is something that can actually have real world consequence. So 
if I have a climate model and I need to know the vibrational frequency of an H2 molecule to understand how it works in the atmosphere, getting an accurate curve is very, very useful. Um, however, from the quantum chemistry perspective, uh, while this is a great achievement for quantum computing, the quantum chemistry perspective is uh, a little bit jaundiced. So um, first of all, all of these molecules were simulated with a very small basis set. So there weren't very many basis functions that were included. The other thing to notice is, is that all of these molecules are planar. So the, the way that this saves you in a, a computation is the two hydrogen atoms on the end of that uh, beryllium H2 molecule, these have a comparatively weak interaction because they're farther away. And this makes it easier to apply uh, uh, gates for what we're gonna do, for what I'm gonna show next. Um, the other thing is, is that while these energies might look pretty good, uh, they're actually horribly inaccurate. The uh, scale here is that the energies are on about a 10th of a heart tree. That's what's on the, uh, the y-axis. And it turns out that in order to compare with the experiment, you need two orders of magnitude better. You need one millihart tree or so. And the other thing, which I think is maybe the most important from this list, so you, you can maybe think that you can improve on every other uh, cr critique that I'm offering here, just as a, as a way to motivate more progress, not to say that this is a, a bad result. Um, but every time I prepare the wave function, I must measure it and then I destroy it in the process. And this is a feature that is not on uh, classical solvers. And really it's that last um, issue that, that uh, we're gonna uh, try and make the most progress on in, in the new results. So the algorithm that I'm gonna talk about as to how to prepare the wave function is uh, real-time evolution. And there are other algorithms in the literature, but some of the features that cause real-time evolution to be inefficient, uh, I think it's a, just a general um, good algorithm to look at that has the same basic features as, as others. So um, the solution strategy is to prepare a Hamiltonian H0 that you know the wave function of or can get by some means. And then with a real-time evolution, so e to the i h t, I take this time-dependent Hamiltonian and I slowly tune in the interactions so that it becomes a completely new Hamiltonian by the end of the time uh, 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 sweep. And this essentially is, is the same basic trick that you play when you want to write down uh, quantum field theory in, in, terms of, in terms of something formal. And, uh, but it's you know, the, a, a nice first attempt um, to try and do quantum computing uh, on the quantum computer or uh, quantum chemistry on the quantum computer. And so just to fill out some more details of how this works is you need to decompose the Hamiltonian in terms of a Trotter-Suzuki decomposition. And then this allows you to, and I'm gonna to appeal to my, my tensor network background here. Um, and if you don't know anything about tensor networks, this is a review article that's written in French and English. So it, it, it uh, might help, it, it helped the students here. Um, but if you apply the, uh, the periwinkle gates onto the wave function, uh, which you can just think about as each one of those blocks is another qubit, uh, if, if in a simplified way. Um, uh, but if you apply those gates, then applying all of the individual gates will then sweep the, you know, evolve your wave function in time by some amount. And so this is, this is fine, but this is the, the basic solution strategy here. And um, my co-author, uh, David Poulon, he had this, um, uh, so for the time it was a, it was a very a useful statement in 2014, that sort of shortly after these experiments came out that uh, used real-time evolution to do these, these molecules, he took a look at what the actual uh, time step size could be for realistic molecules in this paper. And the uh, result in it is, is somewhat disappointing. So um, for a 36 electron molecule, not very much, this is very small by quantum chemistry standards. Uh, it was very time consuming to the point of two to three months I think was their estimate uh, for what this would take. So in the time that it takes to do that, I could do a lot of classical computations. And so this is clearly, this, this needs some help in order to uh, improve as a solution strategy. <coughs> and obviously, as you scale to um, higher and higher, larger and larger systems, then this gets worse and worse. Now, uh, Alexi, <coughs> It's not a COVID cough, I swear. Um, but uh, sorry, yeah, just to answer your, your other uh, little uh, uh, errant sentence there. Um, 
yes, the, the problem does scale as n to the fourth formally, um, but if you, and I think I deleted the equation off of the slide, but if you, if you have a local basis set, then um, in asymptotically as you increase n, it goes to n squared. It just, it takes you a lot of n to get there. So realistically, you'll be somewhere in between n squared and n to the fourth. So that, that just answers your question um, for that one. But so then in the back half of this paper, they try and estimate that and come up with n to the 2.5. But if they would have gone bigger, they would have found something closer to two. Yeah, but that's of course time evolution. Time evolution is a totally different thing. Time evolution is not QMA hard. So uh... that's right. Um, well, yes. So the, the the formal scaling of this algorithm is n to the fourth or n squared or however you want to interpret that. Um, the the total complexity of this algorithm is completely in the prefactor, and the prefactor should be thought to depend on the number of electrons, how strongly correlated the system is, and whatever other property you want to do. So I would say that the computational complexity, you know, the the you know, if you, if you took a bunch of materials, found the time step that you would need in order to solve them, you would find that as you got hard, uh, attempted harder and harder problems, that your time step would go down and down and down. And I would say that that is where the, the computational complexity is, but yeah, yes. Uh, keen, keen insights, I'm, I'm very happy. I think I, I, I was struggling where to write this, this talk and uh, good, okay. So, um, okay, so this, this last problem of, uh, sort of plaguing quantum chemistry uh, solutions on the quantum computer is where I'm going to start my discussion of, of maybe where we can uh, uh, take a new algorithm. So here's a general circuit, but I'm going to build it up. So I'll, I'll show this again, and then, and then we can talk about its features. So I've already pointed out that if I just want to discover the energy on a quantum computer, this is somewhat wasteful. So I'm going to spend a long time preparing the wave function. I do not want to simply measure the result at the end. So let me give you like a, uh, a simple version of this circuit that would allow you to not have to um, uh, uh, totally measure the, the, the wave function to get out some observable property. So I, I, uh, the, the RTE box on this diagram is real-time evolution. And this allows you to, from an input potential, generate some interacting wave function. And then from quantum phase estimation, you can estimate what the ground state energy is to some probability. This is great. Okay, so even before we talk about how to get that energy off the quantum computer, which is gonna dominate the next couple of slides, we need to talk about sort of, well, if I'm just sitting there with the wave function and I wanna reuse it for something, I could think about taking that initial potential, adjusting it by a small, some additional function, or maybe as a practical example, taking two H atoms and just moving them slightly farther apart. And then if I were to start with that wave function, I wouldn't have to go all the way back to the start. I could then start with the, the wave function that I had for here. And so if I slowly then drag the, the potential here, I don't have to measure the wave function. I can start with some better wave function and then cut a bunch of time off of the real time evolution. So it's a really simple idea, um, but it's one that allows you to uh, uh, not measure everything and then have to start from zero all the way over again. So if you're thinking about this in terms of a time uh, ordered path integral or something like that, we're basically, we've just, of the possible potentials that we want to look at, we've just ordered them in terms of which potentials are closest. And then we'll start by solving one and then move as we go along. And, and probably actually I, I moved my hands in the wrong way. We probably wanna start far apart because that's where for an H2 atom, Hartree Fock happens to be exact in, in the well separated limit. So if I place a one electron wave function on each of the H atoms, as I then drag them in, I can get a lot of points. Now, the thing that this is missing, this overly simplified algorithm, is, is that I have not pulled off the energy from the quantum computer. So I don't actually know what that is without before I measure. The other problem is, is that the energy is not sufficient to completely uh, give me all the information that I might want about a quantum computer. But this, this is the basic lens that we're gonna use in order to uh, um, analyze this problem. So uh, the other contribution that, that David has in the literature is the introduction of uh, a quantum, what's called a quantum counting algorithm. And this goes by a couple of other names. So one of the other names is a quantum amplitude estimation. And um, uh, I, I think I saw it as something else in one paper somewhere, but uh, they were trying to figure out how to implement a uh, Metropolis-Hastings sampling, so a, a, you know, 
it's a Markovian walk on a quantum computer. And um, apparently they were working on this paper for five years and then David showed up and said, well, you could use a quantum counting algorithm and you would be able to preserve the wave function when you are trying to estimate the, the probability to flip the spin in the system. Um, and you know, this is nice to implement on a quantum computer because there's a square root improvement uh, in the amount of time that it takes because of quantum walks from Shagadi and uh, or uh, child, Childs is the other uh, one. But so um, the idea is, is that uh, uh, if you use this quantum counting algorithm, then you'll be able to pull off information without actually destroying the wave function. And I'm at the very end of this talk, I basically have to say exactly how this algorithm works in order to discuss Green's functions. So I'm not gonna go um, through uh, how it works right now. Um, but what I will go through, what I will say is that if you read this paper, which I think is a very good one to read, at the very end of this paper, they, they are referencing some literature that is trying to estimate gradients of energies for molecules. And uh, they suggest that the Oracle query in the quantum gradient algorithm is, for, is, is accomplished with a quantum counting uh, uh, subroutine. So it, this isn't a completely new idea, but we're really using it to its maximum advantage in this, in this proposal. Okay, so let's go back to the algorithm and see if we can put all these pieces together to then uh, extract arbitrary quantities off of the quantum computer. Uh, and so the, the first two operations of real-time evolution and quantum phase estimation are the same. And then the third one I've abbreviated as QAE for quantum amplitude estimation because there's too many QC uh, abbreviations that could be running around here, but you know, for quantum counting. So quantum amplitude estimation or quantum counting. And this will produce some quantity. On this diagram, it's listed as N, but there could be just about anything that you can think of that you could pull out of the wave function if you want to spend the time computing it. I'm going to focus on the absolute minimum effort required. Uh, and before I go on to do that, I'll just mention that uh, you could try and train a neural network on the quantum computer. Um, but I think realistically, if anybody's looking at this in 25 years, uh, I think it will probably be attempted that you export from the quantum counting algorithm to a classical computer and learn there. But just in case there's some advantage that can be realized by using a machine learning algorithm on the quantum computer in your forward and backward propagation, then I've just, I've listed it here as you would need to use it, but it's, it's, a, it's a very much an extra in this algorithm. Okay, so should we expect an efficient wave, should we expect an efficient solution for all possible potentials? No, absolutely not. Um, the QMA complete part of this algorithm shows its head in that we need to visit an exponential number of systems to get out all possible quantities. So it's still, it's still exponentially hard to solve all of quantum chemistry with this method. Um, but uh, we did look at many other methods that try and take advantage of the quantum computer's ability to solve problems in superposition. And the one that I'm going to sort of highlight here, uh, I, I put up Grover's algorithm in quantum walks just as sort of a dummy uh, in case someone wanted to talk about that. But I think, um, you know, even before Ewan Tang's articles came out in, in 2018, that, that sort of um, cast some shade on uh, uh, quantum machine learning, uh, which if anyone's working on it, please continue. It's, there, there's some good things to do there. Um, but for our purposes here, a quantum machine learning algorithm is probably not going to be a panacea solution. And I say that for one of two reasons. Uh, in order to run the quantum machine algorithm, quantum machine learning algorithm, um, you have to run the ground state wave function calculation several times. And the, uh, as was pointed out in this paper by Servideo and Gortler all the way back in 2004, and then it was rediscovered by DeWolf more recently, I think in 2018, um, the number of training points or the number of Oracle queries, the number of times that you have to run the ground state function can only differ by a polynomial factor. So there's no exponential reduction that should be expected for the number of training points required. And that means that we have to run quite a few um, ground state wave function preparations. Okay, so that was sort of, we've, we've sort of gone through a quantum chemistry part. Now we've come out of a quantum computing part and, and we've basically come up with an algorithm that allows us to identify at least what the opinion of this paper is, is the most uh, bottleneck portion of solving quantum chemistry, which is the actual wave function preparation. And so that at every single 
wave function step, then we can obtain useful quantities and, and use that as we go forward. So what I've skipped over though, is what are the best quantities to actually pull off of the quantum computer? So now we have to go back into quantum chemistry land and, and we have to go back into a, 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 a part of quantum chemistry land that is um, uh, sort of um, regarded as weird even by quantum chemists in, in some situations. So if we return back to 1998, the Nobel Prize had two winners. One was John Popple from earlier, and this one is Walter Cohn. So Walter Cohn uh, in 1964 with uh, uh, Hohenberg wrote down a proof that says that you don't need the wave function. You can replace the wave function by the one body density. So this first equation is saying that the modulus of the wave function with all coordinates integrated out except for one is the one body density. And there's an existence proof that says that the density has a map to the external potential. So essentially what this means is everywhere in quantum mechanics, uh, you can replace the wave function with the density. And this means that there's a massive reduction in the number of parameters that you have to keep track of. So if you use a density functional, you'll be able to solve a much larger system. Now you might say, well, there's some phase information that disappears there, but in principle, you can recover it. I, I give you that it is somewhat difficult in some cases to recover the phase information. So this theory should be regarded as exact. There's, no, there's nothing being approximated yet, uh, but this, this theory is exact. The difficulty in using this theory is that you no longer need to have access to a Hamiltonian in order to solve the theory. Instead of the Hamiltonian, we've now replaced it with the, the mathematical word for thing that maps function to scalar. And that word just happens to be functional. So the way that you find the ground state energy in a very mathematical sense that, that is impractical to implement is you want to look at all possible densities for a given external potential, and you want to find the minimum of those. So the second equation where it's E equals the minimum over the densities, this is just saying that the functional that is written inside of the parentheses must be, uh, you know, whatever the minimum of that functional evaluation is, that will give the, uh, um, the, the ground state energy. So I've written this out as two functionals. One of the functionals we know, that's the external potential functional, and it depends on which system that you visit. F of n, however, has no dependence on V. So it doesn't matter what external potential you're looking at, it is universal to every system. And while that's a great feature, it turns out it's extremely hard to actually find this functional QMA complete. So if we take a look at what the, the universal functional is, it contains the kinetic energy, which is this third equation, plus an electron-electron term. And if we then do a second variational search for the, the minimum wave function that gives the density that we're looking at, so that's two layers of complexity there, then we'll be able to find the functional in this abstract mathematical sense. If you are able to generate efficient uh, expressions for the universal functional, you'd be able to solve quite a bit. And if you could do this accurately, then, then you'd be doing very well. So the, the version of this that I'm, I'm skipping over sort of how you approximate these things in other ways. I'm so, gonna sorry, focus on, th yeah. Th Thomas, is this Hohenberg Cohen, does it rely on the form of the interaction of the Hamiltonian or is this general? That's right, yeah, oh, good, very good, yes. So if you change the form of the interaction, then you can, so the, the, you know, the Hohenberg Cohen theorem for the non-degenerate case says, given an external potential, there's a map to the density. If I, and, but that is for a given electron-electron interaction. So if I change the electron-electron interaction, I could have a different potential that gives that same density. And so that's the whole idea behind Cohn-Shan physics that we'll get to later. But yes, great question, actually. Well, what if you have like Rydberg interaction? So you're different electron-electron, oh. you mean like anything else? Right? Yes, that's right. Yes, yeah. so the universal functional is, is specific to whatever electron-electron interaction that you give it. Um, in this particular case, we only care about Coulomb interactions. And for Rydberg interactions, you could have some limit, maybe. Um, yeah, okay, it would be hard, hard to write down. I'd have to think about it for a minute. but. Uh, uh, in principle, you would be able to uh, um, also do a, a density functional for whatever interaction you want. Isn't it still Coulomb interaction? I mean, Rydberg comes from Coulomb, so I mean, if you yeah. if you have, if you have all your electrons, you're done. No, 
That's right. That's right. I, I think what he's saying maybe is that there's a screening uh, term that might be in these, because I, I, I think in the Rydberg interactions, at least in one dimension, they introduce a screening term that can be, so they, they call it a soft Coulomb interaction. And uh, I, I, th I think that, you know, you, you could have a modification for a, a given system. Um, but it, 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 even if, even if the Rydberg interactions are still done with the full Coulomb interaction, uh, it's still a good question because there's a lot of um, model systems or, or like, for example, if you wanted to apply the density functional that you got for the Coulomb interaction to a Hubbard model, the Hubbard model has a different interaction than that, that requires a different functional. Yeah, I mean, maybe like, what if you have bosonic systems or something just gener more general, you know, can you apply this machinery? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. You can, yeah, you, this, there is a density functional theory for bosons. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Sure. No um, okay, so I, I, this was one of the first papers that came out of um, uh, the graduate student before me uh, was working on machine learning functionals and then Lili and I were, uh, uh, Lili's at Google now, um, but Lili and I were, were told to uh, machine learn the pure density functional instead of cone sham uh, density functional theory. And what it, all I'm going to say about it here is that it works and it doesn't cost an infinite number of training points. And since this work has come out, there are several papers that actually do this on real three-dimensional systems and they find very good results. Um, every exact condition that you can think to write down for the functional is satisfied by the machine learned quantity and it, everything works. So, so I've gotten this question a few times, you know, how do you know that you can actually learn it? And it's like, well, I, I've, I've published a paper on it. So I, I, I submit that as if I can take your faith to, to believe in it, then you can machine learn the universal density functional and perform self-consistent calculations if you want to. Okay, so there's three, how many, how much time do I have left? Um, oh, perfect, we're good. Um, okay, so uh, I have three versions of, of this algorithm that can be presented and each of them essentially um, uh, 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 give a different quantity that is useful. So I'm gonna start off with the first one, which is just pure density functional theory. It turns out that the energy is not sufficient to know everything about the ground state. You need the functional derivative. And it turns out in this case that it's sufficient to just find the density. Okay, so how do we use the quantum counting algorithm to just find the density? And I'll list the coefficients here that you need to find. They're the coefficients of the one body reduced density matrix. And I, I'll anticipate one question probably from someone is why do you need n squared of them? Can't you write it in a basis set that you can just get order n? And the answer is yes, you could do that, but n is going to be larger in general than if you just use the non-local orbital for this. So if you wanted to use plane waves, that's right, this computation reduces down to an order n, but it's a larger n in general for the reasons I discussed earlier. Okay, so once you have the coefficients of the reduced body of the one body reduced density matrix, you can perform a sum and this generates the ground state density um, from the wave function. So the form that's listed on top where I, I've written down some operator C dagger I C J, this is the operator that I can use in my quantum counting algorithm. And this will essentially generate this amplitude and I do that order n squared times. I could also get any level of the reduced body density matrix, but these are the minimum required to describe the ground state. Once I have the density, I turn it over to my machine learning approximation and then that is that. Now to Victor's question, which was very good. Um, the, the question of are there uh, other Hamiltonians essentially that um, uh, allow you to recover the same density at the cost of having a different electron-electron interaction? The answer is yes. And I have alter an alternative way to explain this, but I think it just for the sake of time, I'll just say that in this picture, there's a black line, which represents the density in one dimension for just a one dimensional system. And then there are two potentials that are below it. The purple line represents the external potential for the interacting system. So for the purple line, there's an electron-electron interaction and it generates that density. The question that you can ask is, is there a non-interacting system, the red dashed line, a non-interacting system that when I solve it gives the same density? Now, um, one to skip a few, uh, the, uh, it turns out that for 
when you represent this problem on a grid, cone chain potentials always exist. So sometimes it's mentioned that there's a problem of V representability, but you can prove that, that it's not an issue in this case. So for all intents and purposes, this other um, system always exists here. And it is a much more valuable quantity to solve for than just the density. The density only gives you a limited amount of information. The cone sham potential um, can give you is, is an extremely desirable quantity. You can recover the density from it and get a lot more information about it because it's a, you're solving, you have cone sham orbitals that are useful in other contexts. Um, so uh, the algorithm that I'm presenting here for how to find this on the quantum computer is um, a minimization procedure. And I, I unfortunately didn't put up a, a reference for this, but it's in the paper. And uh, essentially you compute the right term, which is the energy of the current cone champ potential. So given N coefficients uh, that, describe this co that describe this cone champ potential, um, you can generate the energy for that. But then the left uh, uh, expectation value, the interacting wave function, capital Psi, is not an eigenvector of the operator that is in there. So this is something that's suitable for quantum counting. And then we can just use quantum counting as an oracle. Since this is a minimization, we can use a gradient algorithm. And then given those original n coefficients for the cone-champ potential, we evaluate a quantum gradient algorithm with a quantum computing, or with a quantum counting uh, algorithm. I'm rushing because the time. Um, but then we add the results of those gradients back to the original coefficients and then we just repeat. So this is an order n calculation with the, which is cheaper than the order n squared calculation uh, with the proviso that there's a, an extra prefactor uh, at the beginning of uh, that, that computational complexity. So it's not clear in the general case which one of these two algorithms is going to be good, but that's fine. Okay, so the last point, um, which I'm happy to take questions in, in lieu of this, but I think it's this is sort of a, a standalone paper um, that, uh, that came out of this, which is, can you generate a form of the interacting Green's function? And so if you know things about linear differential equations, the Green's function essentially solves for the wave function. So instead of trying to pull off all coefficients necessary to describe the wave function from a quantum computer, I propose that finding the one body Green's function or, or some higher Green's function, which could also be um, treated with this method, that could also happen. So, um, I think I'll just uh, skip so that we can get to questions, but I'll just say, this is the form of the Green's function. You want to isolate uh, as the first wave function that you're going to deal with the C applied onto Psi. And so I'm assuming here that this is something that I can do without error on the quantum computer, although that's at the present time, you know, applying operators can generate some error here. But starting from this wave function, I claim that I can generate all coefficients necessary to generate the continued fraction representation of the interacting Green's function. And so uh, if you're worried about me applying a non-unitary operator onto the wave function, I just, I say you can do this computation twice with two unitary operators, but then add the result in such a way such that you get the, uh, the result. Okay, so um, those coefficients alpha and beta that I showed earlier that are necessary to determine the continued fraction representation of the Green's function are the coefficients in a quantum Lanczos recursion or in a, a Lanczos recursion algorithm. So if you're not familiar with this, that's fine. Um, I, we can talk about it after, um, but essentially I need to generate the expectation value of H on little psi and little psi is not an eigenvalue, eigen, eigenvector in the general case. And then I also need to know what the norm of psi sub n is. And so this, this basically reduces the Hamiltonian down to a tridiagonal form that, that exi exists in this basis. The thing that we're going to do on the, th the last two slides is find alphas and find betas. And then this will allow us to write down the continued fraction representation. So um, I promised that I would go through quantum counting uh, in at least the level of detail that is required for um, uh, this algorithm. And essentially, Given an initial wave function, you can ignore the psi sub n and the beta sub n on the, on the bottom, there's some you know, treasure of, of previous calculations that you're keeping. Uh, if you give it the original wave function and you apply that C operator or some unitary and then do this twice, 
then you can generate the, the size zero coefficient. And that's sort of after the first box in that, that figure. Then you apply the Hamiltonian. And this will, since the wave function is not in a, uh, um, it's not an eigenvector of the operator, you get a linear superposition of the state that you want with the expectation value as the probability relating to the probability. And then you get a bunch of other states that are perpendicular. Now, in order to, if I was just doing regular quantum counting at this point, and I had an eigenvalue there, I would skip that next box, which I'll come back to in a second, and I would go right to the QPE, the quantum phase estimation. I've stored the energy of the wave function at the very beginning. And if I compare it with the energy of the wave function at the very end, then if I do a bitwise operations to condense this down to either matching or not matching, then I can recover that coefficient. Now, in this particular case, for this Langshaus algorithm, I don't have an eigenvector. So what I have to do is I have to undo all the previous operations, and then I have to act like that, that ground state wave function has been recovered. So I, I do exactly the same checking procedure as in a regular quantum counting algorithm, but I've just I've basically undone all the operations after applying the Hamiltonian in this particular case. If I do this enough times, the ratio of hits, when I measure that single qubit at the end, to the total number of times that I uh, performed this algorithm, that turns out to be the correct alpha that I want. And if I get a reject there, there's a, re there's a recovery procedure that I, I just don't have time to get into here. But uh, essentially, I can recover the alpha sub n through this algorithm. OK, that's great. But there's another coefficient to go through. And the beta sub n coefficient, if I just massage that tridiagonal or that, that three-term relation, I can see that it relates to psi sub n and psi sub n minus 1. So I would do maybe all the operations necessary to generate psi sub n as I go up in that first unitary with the Hamiltonian. And then as I undo the Hamiltonian in that next box with the, the line coming down, I would do so treating it as though it was psi sub n minus 1. And then I would perform the, the rest of the algorithm as, as, uh, as advertised here. And then so that's just one step of the three-term recursion. If I then go to uh, uh, quantum computing here, then, then this uh, um, uh, uh, is sort of the full um, step. OK, so I know there was a lot, and I know that it kind of veered into quantum computing and then veered out of quantum computing a little bit. But essentially, what we've identified is, is that it's very expensive to make the wave function on the quantum computer. And we've come up with an algorithm that can al allow for recycling of the wave function um, but still pull off very useful quantities. What quantities? Well, um, those quantities that would be sufficient to make a machine learned density functional theory. And uh, we've been able to pull off not only pure density functional theory, but cone chain potentials, and also the continued fraction representation of Green's functions. So all these post-processing steps are, are set up such that if you had an efficient wave function solver, you could really do some damage with, with a quantum computer. Um, you know, competitively with classical techniques. The only problem, of course, is that uh, the real-time evolution is not sufficient for a lot of cases. So that is the, the area of open work here. Um, and I'll just say, if anyone's from the experimental persuasion, there are reduced models for just two Hubbard sites that you could use to test this. Um, so just in the last 30 seconds that I have, I'll, I'll just say, uh, um, so uh, David Poulon was my co-author on the first project, and, and we worked on this for about three years. And um, uh, I think four months ago now, uh, coming out three and a half months uh, now, uh, he passed away, um, not, not from the, the pandemic, um, uh, too young, but um, uh, he was, uh, uh, as they say in French, uh, uh, a bon vivant, uh, so sort of a vivacious life. And uh, yeah, so I just wanted to sort of dedicate this to him. He, he didn't get to see the final version of the paper or the, the supplemental, but uh, um, he was integral in, in sort of putting this together, and this is sort of his last little gift. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them uh, or talk about anything you want. Uh, or I have many more slides if you need, but uh, um, yeah, thanks for sticking with it. Let's uh, clap. I've unmuted everybody or asked everybody to unmute. Uh, thank uh, Thomas for a good talk. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, feel free to just jump in with questions. 
I'll probably stop recording at this point so that people aren't shy.